Welcome to the Ignited Recovery Podcast, a new way forward for anyone looking for answers but feeling left out. If you've been searching for empowerment, triumph, and purpose, you've found them right here. You won't hear the same solutions, and you're not going to have any excuses to fall back on because Ignited Recovery allows heroes to rise and become their best selves. I'm Dr. Adi Jaffe, and I can't wait to be your guide on this journey. Are you ready to become an Ignited Hero? Welcome, everybody, to today's interview. I'm honored, humbled, and excited to have Dr. Carl Hart with us here today. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us today, man. And I'm happy to be here. You know, we were supposed to do this a long time ago, but I'm, yeah. I'm glad we're doing it now. But yeah, you've, you've been up to a little bit in the meantime. And not like you haven't been up to a lot for decades now. So just so everybody knows, I've known of and admired your work, Carl, for man, more, more than a decade. I mean, like 18, I'd say 18 years or so, because when I came into graduate school, you were already deep into doing neuroscience-based work. So the, the reason I was looking up to you back then had to do with the academics and the neuroscience work that you were doing. And, and then both of us sort of ended up taking very different routes than maybe the traditional routes that were expected at the time, which humbles me more through stories that I'll tell you um, as we talk here today, just really makes me trust a little bit that the path we're taking is, uh, is, is an honorable one, which is not, not necessarily believed by everybody who we left behind. <laughs> let's just say it that way. Um, you wrote, there's two amazing books that you wrote that I, I want to talk about just and bring them up. I have them. I've read them. If you haven't read them and you care about drugs, drug policy, addiction, neuroscience, or just, you know, read about advances in the way we see humanity, uh, high price. And then your new one, uh, drug use for grownups is is amazing i want to get i want to start out with the first one if it's okay even though i know you're kind of on tour for for the more recent one for an academic you talk about a lot of shit that you're not supposed to talk about as an academic in high price um i'll start us off in a small way but grew up in a neighborhood where there was a lot of drugs, violence, guns, et cetera. And then you get into specific stories. Um, and then you, you were involved in criminal behavior and you use drugs um, and you really map out for us that early life, your, your life as an athlete, right? Football player and basketball player and the way in which drugs and violence made their way into your life and even the changes in yourself in terms of your belief about them when you started versus your belief as you became essentially a, a drug expert. Um, for people who haven't read the book yet, I want to I want to go into some of this. Tell us about the neighborhood you grew up in. Yeah, you, you know, uh, I grew up in Miami in a predominantly black neighborhood. It was resource poor. Um, and, you know, if you're not from the neighborhood, particularly if you're not black, you're not from the neighborhood, people are, were afraid to come into the neighborhood. But really, it was just people trying to make it, you know, in, in the United States, how it is, it's segregation in a lot of places. It, it's not, it wasn't very different from those sort of things. But the thing is, the stories get told from the sort of dominant culture perspective. Even the stories that I told in High Price, it still was from through like from a white gaze because my publisher, my agent, all of those folks are their their white folks. And so uh, you tend to hear language like uh, he escaped from this sort of neighborhood. Mm. It's like, what? I didn't escape. I mean, I go back there all the time and I love those people. And so, but it's the way we tell those stories. But I didn't know that until I became a better writer in which I'm still trying to be a better writer. And so uh, the neighborhood certainly might seem foreign to people who's not from the neighborhood, but there were a lot of uh, rules that everyone kind of knew uh, that they may, be, they may play out differently in Main Street. Like for example, uh, if you have a beef with somebody, you have problems, that beef uh, is, is 
typically scored uh, or settled uh, immediately. Whereas in mainstream, you have this behind the back cowardly bullshit where people, you know, do things behind your back and, and then they act as if that's not violent when they are trying to like yeah. take your position or trying to Tear take somebody your lab. Down. Or trying, right. That's some violent stuff. Uh, and so it's equally violent in mainstream, but we just don't think of it that way. And, and mm. so I have to be careful when I talk about where I grew up from, grew up uh, at. And, you know, it, it's like, of course, we were resource poor and resource deprived. So, of course, people try to figure out why, what's going on here. And drugs were blamed oftentimes. And then people yeah. can point to some egregious act of violence. Like that is the norm in that those spaces. And it's not, but it's and certainly the proof. And those acts yeah. are the proof Exactly. That it's the drug addiction within those spaces that causes the 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 foundation of the society there to crumble somehow. Absolutely, and mm -hmm. then so so you're right. I did grow up in in the neighborhood, but I, I just have to be careful about how I how I talk about it because I don't want to disrespect anybody uh, from the, those neighborhoods. Because well, the reason my, the reason I even thought, if you don't mind me, the reason I brought it up was I was told by an advisor early-ish in my career, like my first year of my PhD program, when they heard that I had a personal connection to drug use, I used to be addicted to meth. Um, when they heard that I had a personal connection to drug use, they told me with no qualms, don't tell anybody about this. If you tell people about it, your stance as an academic, as somebody who can be objective, whatever being objective really means. Um, your stance as somebody who can be objective as a, as a researcher and an academic and learner will suffer and they'll think you have a cause. And the reason I wanted to bring up the neighborhood you grew up in, your story of going into these academic institutions, and you mentioned this in the new book and a lot of other places, you're surrounded by a lot of people who didn't grow up in a neighborhood like the one you grew up in. Yeah. Um, and and there are probably, if I'm, if I'm right, there are probably a lot of assumptions that people make, yeah, regardless sure. of whether they hear the story. And I wanted to know if once everybody found out, if the assumptions took even more of a toll or became even more prominent. Yeah, you know, you and I both know people tend to kind of hide the what they really feel if those assumptions uh, may be negative and they don't want you to think of them as being less than objective. Uh, and so certainly maybe some people have some of those assumptions. Like, for example, now I'm, um, I am a known drug user or I am um, uh, owning whatever it is. And so people may say, like you said, about being objective, you can't be objective, but you know, it's really nonsense because our work is peer reviewed. And you know, if the methods do not stand up, they don't stand up. And then people may say, well, you have this, some sort of agenda. And it's like, well, you're right. I do have an agenda. Uh, I have an agenda that we treat people with decency and humanity. You're right. Mm. And as if they don't have an agenda, which yeah. they have an agenda and their first agenda typically in our field is, you know, you got to keep your lab funded. You got you got to pay all these salaries and so forth. And that agenda dictates what you do because you are chasing grant funding and you yeah. will make sure that your project are in line with the funders sort of wishes. And, and that's an agenda, but we act as if it's not an agenda. So it's like, sure, let's put all the cards on the table. And, you know, you brought in, so I'm going to take this conversation in probably a million different directions because there's so much I want to talk to you about, but you brought something up important, right? People don't understand. Like if my wife, we talk about our MDMA use, for instance, or, you know, we've talked about some hallucinogenic use, my wife and I on this podcast. Um, but we're not dependent on somebody paying our bills. Uh, what, you know, sorry, somebody paying our bills is not dependent on whether or not they believe that we use drugs. And what people fail to understand sometimes is, and this is, again, it goes back to you growing up in that neighborhood, you admitting uh, in a book in black and white that you've stolen, you've aimed guns at people like that, or you were in the car when that was going on, right? Like that puts you at risk like that. Each one of those actions was one, and you know, you're a smart guy. Like you knew saying this will make people look at you sideways 
And so maybe before the assumptions were subliminal and, and implicit and nobody talked about them, but now it's like you gave them, you gave them wood for the fire, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, and, 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 you know, you talk about these things, it nicely described what I talked about in the book, uh, but also remember uh, those events when I was uh, sticking people up or what have you. Uh, I was much younger. I was 17 years old. And those those events are so far removed. And of course, I'm not the person that I used to be. And I describe those events uh, to show people, you know, uh, particularly people who look like me, who come from these spaces, like, look, you can do this too. Um, and you shouldn't let that hold you back and, and that sort of thing. And so I had to do that in order to mm. make sure that uh, people understand that we have a wide range of backgrounds that participate in science. Um, but again, it was removed from who I am today. So when you talk about things that are less than mainstream uh, uh, and maybe not be acceptable today, who you are today, like coming out of the closet as a drug user today, far more dangerous than me talking about something that happened 40 years ago, you know what I'm saying? Or 35 years ago, it's a lot different. And so, um, uh, so I wasn't so much worried about what my colleagues thought about me. I, I don't really care as long as I treat people well and I don't disrespect people. I don't treat them anything less than human. That's all mm. I care about. If I treated them well, that's all I care about. Yeah. Um, how they how they view me about some past behavior or whatever, that's on them. I can't control it. I can not control how I treat them now. I got it. No, so, so smart and so intelligent. And also, look, you put in the work, man. So you did years, and I'm talking about it did like it was prison sentence, but you did years just grinding, becoming, like I said, when I first knew you, I knew none of this stuff. I just knew you as an accomplished behavioral neuroscientist and, you know, psychopharmacologist studying animal models around cannabis and things like, right. That's, that's what I knew you as all this other stuff was hidden, at least hidden for me. I don't know how many of your colleagues knew it, but when I would see you at conferences and things like that, that wasn't the Carl Hart story. That's um, right. So you put a lot of work to then get to a place where you could say to people, all right, look now, I'm going to, it's like, the, it's like the wizard of Oz thing, right? Like now I'm going to pull the curtain back and yeah. I'm going to show you, I yeah. was able to do all of this, even though I came exactly from where, and I do exactly the things that you believe make what I just accomplished impossible. That's exactly right. And the way you said it really helps to kind of put a better understanding on why one has to tell people these stories. So we can dispel these myths that we hold about people's limitations and, and, uh, or these things that we think will limit them or prevent them from uh, becoming something other than the box that we have put them in. And so mm. uh, I like the way you put it. Yeah. And so let's, let's come to the new book, right? Drug Use for Adults. Um, what a concept. And, and even farther what a concept for somebody who studies the neuroscience and pharmacology of drugs to come out and you talk about some people who inspired you and i want to talk about that in, in here as well some people who inspired you to change your view around drugs but the predominant narrative in america and has been since america was established the puritanical view in america is probably best summarized by the uh, south park drugs are bad okay you know like that's pretty much isn't that kind of like what we just all believe? Yeah, South Park, they kind of knock it out of the park every time. Yeah, but that's it. That's exactly it. Drugs are bad. One of the things that just, well, I'll share a story with you. I was Please. giving a talk. Uh, giving a talk in Vancouver with high price. And I was talking to the sort of community group, these activists who had helped to inspire this thing they call um, insight, where people, it's a, say, the injection it's a, site, yeah. it's right. It's a supervised uh, injection facility. And so I was giving a talk and one of the activists, and I was saying how um, uh, I think that we should have decriminalization and, 
we're not ready for legalization. I was going on like I was the authority um, for other adults, you know, and then somebody, you know, in the Canadian polite way, uh, this person was more, a lot more polite than I tell, that I remember it. I just remember it, the, the person's being like, who in the fuck are you to tell me that I can't use drugs? You know, I'm older than you and, you know, I handle my responsibility. I do whatever. He, he was absolutely right. And it dawned on me that I didn't have the right to tell adults what they can do. And, um, and that really changed my mind about, he helped me to like, really think about uh, what am I doing? Uh, who do I think I am? Uh, and then I had to look at all of our data, what we were doing in the lab, seeing that when we give drugs to people, they were fine. Uh, we do this every day. We give drugs like crack. We give drugs like methamphetamine. We do all of these drugs and we, and we do it uh, with the blessing of federal agencies like the FDA, like uh, our institutional uh, review boards. We do it with their blessings. And these people who are research participants, they do well and they're having a good time. But yet we have those stories like mm, drugs are bad. It's like, what in the world? What's going on here? Uh, yeah. And I had bought into this. And, and all of these things just made me realize that um, I am telling a biased story. Mm. I am um, uh, not uh, giving a comprehensive view and understanding to the public of what drugs do and don't do. Uh, it's true. Drugs certainly can have some negative effects, but the predominant effects are positive if they were not we wouldn't be allowed to continue to give thousands of doses of these most vilified drugs every day, like, I mean, or every year, like we do. So um, that the reality wasn't matching up with the story. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I want to dig into that a little bit, right? Because so much is coming up for me, the concept of confirmation bias, which we've talked about on here for people before, but but I think this is important for people to hear. Here's a, here's a guy who's an expert, like not just with credentials, but with experience, personal and otherwise and professional. You're an expert on drugs. And what, what I'm hearing you say is sitting there giving a talk in Vancouver around this concept of safe injection sites and these things that are supposed to be saving lives, et cetera. You had a perspective on drugs. You had a specific way that you were looking at drugs and you were, you were espousing that. You were talking about it, given your expert knowledge and standing. And this one person who was a drug user, it sounds to me like, is somebody who used yes. drugs, yes. stood up and kind of had the balls, if I can, to give you a very different perspective. And, yeah. and what, what do you think allowed you? Because confirmation bias is really strong, right? A lot of times we will fight, and I have. In my old days, I, I bought a man, the NIDA and I AAA model of addiction. I bought in full lock, stock and barrel, you know, chronic relapsing disease, uh, sensitization. The brain never recovers. Like I bought yes. into the whole thing. Robinson and Barrage. It's, you know, yes. you get stuck in this mode and you can never pull yourself out. Yes. And, and it took many conversations and many different people and, and a lot of insight for, to yes. slowly modulate what allowed you in that moment to leave decades of drugs, make people lose control over themselves and they shouldn't be allowed to use them freely. And because this guy's perspective was different, what allowed you to incorporate it in? Do you know? Um, I was embarrassed. Uh, you know, uh, we supposedly deal in evidence and data and he presented arguments that were better than mine. And so the best arguments win. Mm. Um, and so it was kind of easy for me because I didn't want to be embarrassed publicly ever again like that. So uh, I try and make sure that at least my arguments are tight. Um, and so uh, the guy's name was Dean Wilson and Dean, was, he presented a, a better argument than me. And he appropriately uh, tongue lashed me in public. And so um, I, I had to take it, you know, because no. he was right. You know, it's funny. You settled the beef right there, man. Exactly. 
he and, had and, a beef you know, and you were like, yo, let's let's deal with this right now. You're absolutely right. And again, he was an activist. He wasn't an academic. And so he had no qualms in basically putting me in my place. And he he was right. And that's the thing about it. it the beautiful thing about for me in terms of being in science or dealing in evidence, it's like when people have better arguments, it's like you acknowledge it and you can also adopt that to your own and that makes you better. And so that's uh, that's how I looked at it. Um, and now Dean and I are, are, are friends. <laughs> that's beautiful. It takes a lot of humility and, and open-mindedness, right? You have to, I feel like maybe you have to have been proven wrong or learned that you don't know everything a few times. Like I remember there were definitely times in my younger graduate school days where I, I felt like I was a know-it-all. Like, I, oh, no, no, no. I took that class. I read those papers. I, I know this field, right? And yet there's got to be an openness in you to be able to look at somebody else and go, oh, man, I didn't even think of this data. I didn't incorporate it. Well, you know, again, this is like during the high price sort of era. And I was, you know, over 40 um, and uh, wasn't a young sort of uh, full of testosterone kind of guy and that sort of thing. So I, it doesn't really I'm not invested so much that I can't see somebody else's perspective. Even today, even with the book I wrote, there are uh, limitations in that book and people are happy to point them out. And I hope I'm able to just be able to like weigh the evidence and then uh, accept it and, 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 and incorporate it if, if, if they are, if they have a better argument. Um, I just hope that, well, that's the kind of person I'm trying to be. Sometimes I fail, but that's the person I'm trying to uh, be. That's beautiful, man. Um, so the premise of the book, as you mentioned a little bit already, um, is that while drugs can result in damage, and let's say most of the people I now work with in my world are the people for whom drugs did create some negative consequences and and undo burden, and they're trying to figure out how to get out of that. Although, hopefully, we'll, we get to talk about some of the myths I think we can still get rid of, even in that world. But what you're saying that is is very well known among those of us who study the tendency to fall into addiction is that actually the vast majority of people who experiment with any drug don't end up addicted to it. Some try it and never use it again. Some try it and use it recreationally here and there. Some try it and use it relatively regularly without problems, which is, I think, one of the things you talk about in the book that may surprise people, right? Um, and then, yes, a, a small minority of people end up using drugs, relying on them in some unfortunate ways or in some, in some other way getting addicted in, in the more traditional sense of the word. Um, and you point out something in the book that I think is, I want I want this to kind of be the jumping off point. That behavior, trying out drugs and not getting in trouble most of the time and sometimes getting in trouble, it happens equally among all people to some extent. But weirdly, white people don't get in trouble for it as much. Um, and so the concept gets to hold, drugs are bad for you, don't use them, because we see all these people getting arrested for drugs. But it's created a bigger and bigger um, gap, separation. Um, I don't know what else to call it, between classes, races, and, and, and groups of people in an unjust way, a way that doesn't actually relate to the drug use itself. And I wanted you to dig into that because especially given the climate right now in the country, I think this is a very important lesson for people. Yeah, there's a lot going on when we think about racial discrimination, class discrimination in terms of the enforcement of drug laws. This is this is not unique to drug laws. This is just how things play out in our country. Poor people, despise groups, they get the short end of the stick in a, in a number of domains. And drug drug enforcement is is one of those dom domains. Uh, you know, so uh, black people are, uh, for example, far more likely to be arrested for drugs than their white counterparts, even though they use drugs uh, in numbers relative to their uh, 
proportions in the population. And they also said, uh, we, we know that most people buy drugs from uh, someone within their own race. And so uh, all of these things being equal, we know that this is a re, uh, uh, discrimination, racial discrimination. It's kind of simple if you have like uh, 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 neighborhoods that are uh, disproportionately poor or, or uh, lack uh, resources that are black, police, uh, they tend to put their resources there in part because it's it's easy prey or it's like shooting fish in the barrel. Uh, and also, if the police screw up, those folks don't have the resources to uh, get lawyers to keep the police in check. So all of these sort of things. But you can find the same thing in poor white communities in places like Oklahoma. Um, they're getting their butts kicked in these kind of situations or uh, wherever you find poor people or despised people, you see this kind of thing. Or even if you don't, uh, you don't necessarily have to be poor or despised, you can just be low on the uh, chaining, uh, on, the, on the sort of hierarchy of things. Uh, you think about what's happening this very moment with the White House. Um, they did this past week, they fired uh, or suspended uh, people who reported using marijuana. Um, and so they fired or suspended those folks. Meanwhile, even though, even though the administration did too. Exactly. Meanwhile, you know, the vice president, she uh, got a lot of kudos for acknowledging that she smoked weed in college and that sort of thing. Mm. So you so you see these kind of uh, disparities, differences or differential treatment, depending upon the class uh, people who are affected. So this is one of the main ask of uh, drug use for grownups. I asked uh, middle class, privileged, respectable people to get out of the closet about their drug use so they could be in solidarity with those people who are catching hell merely because they have been identified as a drug user. And so that's one of some of the most violent pushback that I've gotten from the book. It's like the <laughs> middle class privileged user would be like, I have all of this to lose. I can't, I can't do this. But yet those mm. same people, those same people have as their heroes, people like Rosa Parks or Martin Luther King, those yeah. people who put things on the line. And so I'm asking them, Put, put something some on the line on the line uh, yeah. um, because it's wrong what we're doing. It's mm. not like it's not like this isn't wrong. It's like, why are you arresting people for what they put in their bodies? And then people say things like, well, they're going to screw up and they, they, it affects the whole family. It's like, well, we have laws for when people screw up. And that's what we should get them for when they screw up and not for this activity. Mm. Um, and, and so it's wrong. It's just it's completely it, it, it's wrong it's immoral it's all of these things but we allow it to happen yeah man there's so much packed into that piece right there i mean first of all the thought and i've never heard this term used before but despise people alone is something i feel like we could do a whole episode on because it, it gets so much more clearly right up uh, <laughs> it gets so much more clearly to the problem instead of like people of color or marginalized people, right? I, the euphemism that I hear oftentimes. And, and as a white person, it's always hard to even know, I'll be honest, to, to know what term to use because you don't same want to. Same here, man. Uh, same know. here. I feel the same way. Yeah, like I don't want to offend, but at the same time, man, despised people gets to the fucking core of it. It's like, it's, you know, it's not just, pe yes, it's also people of color, but I'm a person, I have a color. You have a color. We all have a color. Absolutely. It's sort of, Absolutely. it that doesn't really get to the point of, people who others look down at only because of who they are and they despise them for that. Um, and then you brought up a point that I think is, is really, really broad. And, and yes, it's brave both to ask people to come out of the closet and you're doing it yourself. So you're not asking them to do something you're not doing. You're saying, look, I'm a respected member of society. I'm a professor. Look at everything I've done. I'm going to write a whole book telling people what I've done and how I've done it and proving to them it's not that big a deal partially to kind of be that tip of the arrow, right? To say, you can do this and still maintain your career. So kudos on that, first of all. Um, secondly, what do we like, what do we do with the fact that too many people, 
in society in general can see injustice happening everywhere and go, man, that's, that's terrible. We really, we really got to change that. That shouldn't happen anymore. Well, why don't you go do something about it to change? Well, like, you know, I got that meeting later and then uh, my boss wouldn't really like it if I, uh, if I said something about this, so I won't. And, and they sit in the background and I think maybe that's why, to my view, what was so, um, what felt so different about this recent push around racial and, and, and social injustice was people saying, hey, let's not let one more of these fucking things pass by us because this is happening over and over and we keep getting pissed about it for three weeks and then nothing happens. But what I noticed is when it caught more steam and it got more serious, everybody got really uncomfortable. And I don't know how it feels to you. I've talked to some of my my friends about this recently and it feels like it's receding a little. It's receding a little bit because kind of like we all benefit from the institutions, the way they're set up right now. Those of us have those of us having this conversation right now have some benefit. It's like, you said it so perfectly well. Well, yes, I want this to change, but I don't want to lose anything in the process. Um, and I don't know that that's possible. So let's, even if we just focus on drug use, let's just, cause that's the book. Let's just focus on drug use. There are a lot wow. of people. Uh, you hit it on. Sorry, go, go, on go, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, oh, go ahead. You, you just hit it on the head. You hit it. You hit it on the head when you pointed out that like people who are like having this conversation, like you and me, uh, privileged folks, and we have we've done OK in this under this system. You know, we're OK. And it's like, fuck, if we say some, do we do we mess with our privilege? You know, and that's that's what people are thinking. And, and so that's what they're looking at, including me. I had to like look at this whole thing. And it's like, I had to think about my children. And you, as you know, with these, this new, this young generation, uh, they are, uh, they make me proud because they, they are like saying, this is crap, what you all have done. I don't want them to look at me and say, you are a part of the problem and you were a part of the problem because, I mean, they will have every right because I'm benefiting and I didn't do anything. And so it's like, I, so I have to say, well, uh, if those people are suffering, uh, then I'm suffering because nobody is free until all of us are free. And so mm. uh, that's e that means even if I ha lose some privilege or lose, but at least I know I will be living uh, a life in which I stood up on behalf of those who may not have been as capable of, of standing up. And I what didn't idly sit a, on the sideline and say, um, yeah, I know it's happening, but I have an excuse for not doing something when I could do something. That's why I gave people something that they could do. Just get out of the closet. We all can do that. I'm not asking too much of you. I'm just asking you to get out of the closet. You can do it in a big way, a small way, but please show up on behalf of these people in, in a way that you, that you have the mm. skills to do something. That's why I only ask people to come out of the closet. I, I try mm. not to put too much burden on anyone because I know people have their families, they have their life and they have their, they are also busy, but, we can all come out of the closet. Yeah. Um, yeah. How powerful would it be if we all were more honest about what we actually do behind closed doors for so much, right? I have a, one of our mottos at Ignited is fuck shame. Um, and, and this thing you talk about, I think also the people were hiding and in the closet to some extent, and I, I'm literally putting myself in the same bucket right now as I'm talking about this, have some built in, even if we know it's improper, we have some built-in shame or on our own behavior thinking to ourselves, well, what will people think of me, right? Yes. What if my colleagues, my friends, my neighbor, the other couple that comes over to have yeah. glasses of wine with us on a, on a Saturday, if they knew we also do drugs, what are they, what would they think of us? Right. And yes. And I think the point you're making that is really important for people to hear is the only reason we're afraid of that is because not enough of us are talking about the fact that we're all fucking doing it. Exactly. Exactly. That's it. 
That's exactly right. And then, you know, having traveled around the world for this book, you know, I tried to set uh, many of the chapters in different countries so people could get a flavor of that. This is not only in the United States, this is everywhere. Uh, people are doing exactly the same thing. Um, and many of these people are just like you and me. They are working, they're respectable people, uh, but uh, they're also engaged in this activity. But our picture of the, the users, the drug users are, is one thing, but the people who are supporting this multi-billion dollar industry are people who have jobs, people who are middle and upper class folks, because otherwise, this multi-billion dollar industry of drug trafficking would not be able to be supported. So I mean, true. it's just logical. And, but we act like, oh, it's those poor people. It's like, are you kidding me? No, the so poor true. people could not, could not support this industry alone. So true. I mean, just for people who want to really dig into some research, because, you know, in case people listening are not aware of this, alcohol is a freaking drug. Um, and... When you look at the at the breakdown of how much people drink by deciles, by like um, by percentage of drinkers, the entire alcohol industry supports itself pretty much based on the last ten percent, like the heaviest ten percent of drinkers, maybe five, six, seven percent. Those people drink seventy to eighty percent of alcohol that's consumed in this country. Uh, I technically am close to that number. I think I have like I don't know, I have like six to seven drinks a week, five to seven drinks a week on average. So I'm not quite in that number, but I'm I get close up there. Um, but the vast majority of Americans don't even drink enough to support the alcohol industry. And so what, what you bring up right now is if you follow the numbers, the same exact thing is happening with drugs, right? Like, and I, I used to sell drugs for a living. I've talked about it on here before. Half my customers were actors, writers, architects, lawyers. Um, you know, I think I had a judge in there, like, 85, 90% of them were well-employed people who did well. Some of them came for money and just had a bunch of money sitting around and didn't need to do much. But the point you make is the stereotype is drug users are poor, broken, helpless, hopeless, people on the side of the street kind of curled up under a bridge. If that were true, there would be no drug industry. That's right. So important. That's exactly right. So important. Um, okay. So now let's move to this to this next piece that I think we just touched on a little bit. Do you feel I feel like there's a, a sense in our society, like any drug use, regardless of the data, that if you use drugs, now cannabis is becoming legal to some extent in many, many places. So maybe a, this will go away slightly. But if you use any, I'm calling them harder drugs in quotes for those of you not watching us right now, if you use those you're a bad person who's going to become addicted if you don't watch out. Would you agree? Yes. Um, even though we know that like 70 to 85, 90% of people who use them will, will not have problems. Okay. How do we change? And I know you're doing some of that in the book, so that's why I'm asking this. How do we change that concept in a major way? Like how do we, because yes, if one of us that comes out at a time maybe three, four generations down the line, there'll be a change. But do you see a path to understanding the role these drugs actually play in our lives? Like the utility they have, how people use them, the different ways to use them. You even talk in the book, this is not a book prescribing drugs or teaching you how to use drugs. That's not what I'm doing here. I'm just explaining the scenario. Do you see a point and how do we get there where it is a little bit more like, hey, when you're stressed out, here are some things that could help. Uh, here's how those are done. Here's how to use them safely, et cetera. Do you see a point like that ever in the future? Uh, when I wrote the, when I began writing the book, I certainly thought so. Um, and so when we think about with psychedelics, it seems like it's, it's growing more acceptable to say, oh, under these conditions, psychedelics can help with this. That seems more acceptable. But then when you think about some like opioids, uh, heroin, uh, I, it's hard to see us doing that sort of thing, in part because you have so much buy-in from so many different sectors in our society, like parents have bought into opioids are evil. It's not my parenting. I, it's not that I didn't provide supervision and I didn't. Mm -hmm. So I'm absolved. 
the person who has a problem with opioids has bought into it because they know that the only way I can get your sympathy is for me to say, oh, this drug was so powerful, it took over my life. And then so you are saying, that's right, bro. You, it's not you, it's the drug. And, and so they, buy, they bought into it, although that story is an exaggeration. And it's not to blame them, but it's, it's the only way they can get sympathy. Um, and then the cops buy in and the medical examiners bought in because they all get funding. Their funding's based on this. Um, NIDA researchers now, too, if you have opioids in your grants, it increases the likelihood of being funded. So all of these people have like bought into this, not to mention these other folks who bought into it. So it's harder now with the opioids to see someone saying, yeah, man, I take opioids to in order to, I don't know, uh, be more magnanimous and to be more forgiving and to uh, think about how I can be a better person. Uh, people wow. can't hear that. They can't you know, man, it. just hearing just hearing you say that, even though I do the work that I do, and even though I'm open, hearing you say somebody saying, no, you know, every once in a while, I use some opiates, I use a little heroin, I use this, to just kind of get out of, break out of my skin and just get myself a little more in touch with a different version of me, made me uncomfortable. Because for whatever subliminal implicit reason I've bought into the story, you know? Yeah, it's a difficult one with the opioids because of all we've been inundated with uh, opioid crisis. And they show the big number, 70,000, 80,000 people die from overdoses. And it's not opioid overdoses, those numbers, but the, they, they imply it. And then like the next sort of sentence, then they clarify what they mean. That's all drugs. But the pairing is overdoses, opioids, 70,000, 80,000. That's the pairing, although that's not what the article says. And they know what they're doing. And so it's, it's, and then there are people who die, for example, from overdoses who, who have an opioid. But when you go into the numbers, you realize it's not primarily from a single opioid or an opioid that people are taking, you know, uh, it's something that they might be, they weren't expecting like fentanyl or other things are going on, but that's too nuanced for people to understand. We have this story that opioids are bad, but mm. I think about my MDMA use. I think about my opioid use, whether it's heroin or some other opioid similar sort of ways that uh, I use them um, uh, for uh, those things, like to be more uh, forgiving and to be, uh, to be in touch with my actions on um, somebody else. Uh, you know, if I have uh, made someone feel badly after doing MDMA or something, I can try to see like, oh, I can't do that after doing something like heroin. Oh, I can't do that. That's not, I have to make amends. I have to correct that behavior. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we have a stereotype with opioids. Like you take them to be numb. It's like nothing can be further from the truth. If someone is taking an opioid and they're like nodding and they're uh, not with it, that means they took a dose that's too high. Opioids help you feel um, mm -hmm. and uh, emotionally. It helps you uh, when you're taking them for those kind of purposes, but we have this uh, 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 misapprehension about what opioids actually do. And this misapprehension is promoted in the media, in films and all of these things. And so every time I see portrayals of heroin use or opioid use uh, on, in movies and things, it's like, I have to turn it off. I can't even mm -hmm. watch uh, drug movies or things that have drugs in it because it's it's so cheap it's a cheap way to explain away uh, something that you don't understand or something you don't have time to delve into and so filmmakers use drugs uh, opioids now especially in this way to you be like uh, uh, you don't understand this person oh say that they were a heroin user that explains away everything you don't have to go mm -hmm. into any detail um, oh, wow. and so um, i don't know if it's going to happen with opioids in our time do you think since our perception is that drugs are bad and people who use them will get addicted and then 
most people who use drugs and are not addicted hide the fact that they use drugs because the myth is that if you tell people you use drugs, then you're a drug addict. And again, that's an air quotes because I hit the fucking term, but then you're an addict. So you just don't tell people about it, which means that the only people that we see using drugs primarily are the people who have struggled with them mightily. And, and then there is a point where at least for some people, I'm not saying for everybody, but there's a point where those people are using it to maybe for escape or they're using it because there was trauma and they're trying to deal with it. But now what we're doing, and this is a, I'm a statistician and behavioral neuroscientist. So this is a mistake that a lot of gets made a lot of times. And I just thought about it when you were saying it, we're looking at a very small subsection of drug users. And we're saying, you see, Jesse uses heroin to escape his rape when he was a child. Melissa uses alcohol because she hates her husband and she wishes she was out of that relationship. And, and, you know, and Rob smokes a lot of crack because he can't deal with his life and he hates his work. Drugs are bad because they make you escape your reality. And we learn everything from these people, even though they're 10, 15 percent. And the other 85 percent of people are sitting there going like, I don't know, I just did some blow at a party on the weekend because I just wanted to be up and dance and I'm OK. And so maybe by calling people out and making them come out of the closet, what will happen to the rest of society is they'll have a bigger sample size almost to understand what's happening. Absolutely. You know, that's the goal. Uh, so we can see that um, uh, among drug users, just like among the general population, you have some great people. You have some fucked up people. You have the wide range of people. Um, but, you know, we in the lab, for example, when we give drugs like heroin, MDMA, crack cocaine, all of these things. We see this. We see that these folks are uh, primarily decent people. Otherwise, they wouldn't make it in the studies. We see that they are responsible. Uh, we place all kinds of demands on their schedules and we require all of these onerous sort of tasks of them and they meet them, whether they are in the heroin studies, whether they're in the MDMA studies. But that story never gets told in our conferences, as you know, um, at, at the conferences, you never hear that. You just show, they show things like, well, these people might be, um, we saw some, they're not performing as well on this cognitive task. Don't mean that they're outside of the normal range. They're just not forming, performing as well. So we say that they're cognitively impaired. Never mind the fact that your sample were all college students and they're doing well in college. Right. <laughs> never mind that. That never gets mentioned. Um, and, and so you focus on this sort of one uh, sort of effect that you have on this one task and it's not even outside of the normal range. Mm. But it gets presented at the conferences like, oh, that's a problem. Yeah. Never mind that these people are accomplished people in life. That never gets mentioned. Mm. I was going to ask, how, how do you now resolve? Because you've done a lot of studies showing pathways and cognitive alterations and changes in cravings or, or executive function, right? Based on specific drug use or specific tasks. What, what have you done already and how are you bridging the gap now when you present your work or even when you submit for grants to be able to incorporate this new view of our best version that can be here in the near future and, you know, the more nuanced, nitty gritty of psychopharmacology research. Yeah. So luckily, uh, one of the things I could do is I go back and look at old papers and look at my verbal behavior. What, what was I saying? There are some cases where I'm exaggerating some, I don't know, minor effect uh, on cognition. Uh, but Luckily, uh, that sort of behavior is rare in my papers. And so, and we've also always presented all of the data, even mm -hmm. if we didn't talk about the data. And so the data are there. Um, and so uh, I, I, I worry about that. I do worry that uh, I misled someone. Uh, and, but it's nice to have it there so people could under can understand that yeah, I made mistakes too, and I will continue to, and we all do. But the trick, uh, the key is to 
understand this and try to get better and not make those mistakes in the future. And that's what mm-hmm. I'm trying to do. And when we think about grant support, um, I have been supporting my research in the past several years by myself, uh, giving talks and those sort of things, and then funding my research with those funds uh, because I don't want to be, embo- uh, I guess, beholden to uh, NIDA or anyone else. I want to be able to just ask the questions that interest me and uh, not worry about uh, what other sort of people who are biased think, um, even though they pretend that they're not biased. But I still review grants for NIH. I still am on, I'm on editorial uh, journal boards. And so I'm there to make sure to try to help keep this, keep people honest. I'm, tr- I'm there to make sure that people um, uh, check their biases at the door. Mm. that's beautiful man you know you you just said people who think they're not biased or people who believe they're not biased i i think this is actually an issue we have in general in as humans not even just around drugs and it relates to what you started us out with today you know we talk in psychology about the fundamental attribution error right when i look at myself i know all the nuances i understand well i'm in a hurry because my wife is sick and she's at the hospital and my kids home so i got to get to the i got to get to the hospital really quick that's why i'm driving like a crazy person and cutting people off but when i'm in traffic and somebody else is cutting me off they're just an asshole <laughs> right cuz i don't know i just don't so i think what's beautiful about what you're doing right now is i yes working on shifting the paradigm for society at large in terms of how we talk about drugs. And as more people learn, oh, wait, my neighbor does mushrooms. I didn't know that. Or, you know, my neighbor takes opioids. I didn't know that. Right. It, it'll re-regulate for people what that means. So on one level, that's, that's great work. But in the other level, I got to tell you, man, just the being an academic and saying, Hey, you don't have to buy in fully to the system. You just don't, you can, you can find other ways of studying important things, you still have to know the methods, you still have to do good work, you still have to really be part of the peer review world, but but you get to, you, what you're doing is you're injecting yourself into it and saying, look, I've done all that, right? I paid my dues and I'm, I'm a, an accepted member of this group, but now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn the mirror on you a little bit and say, what are we doing? Like, what now, now we're all chasing opioids as the end all be all of drug addiction research, you know, why is that? And are we, are we doing a disservice, not just to the people who are then reading the U S news article about what we're doing, but to academia itself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, so NIDA was not originally a part of NIH. Um, and so uh, it was in the 80s when NIDA became, I think 84 became a part of NIH. And people were worried uh, at that time that becoming a part of NIH would make NIDA uh, biased. Like you're saying, we're worried about our field because the NIH's mission to, is to focus on pathology, right? And so when we think about drugs, pathology is a minority of the effect not the predominant effects. And so people expressed concern as early as the 80s when NIDA became a part of NIH because of this mission. Um, And it has come to pass. Their concerns, uh, that's what I'm writing about. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, Of course, I didn't know that this happened in 84, that people expressed this concern. I only learn about it now that I'm expressing this concern because people who were there, they tell me and they point out what the arguments were. And lo and behold, they have come to pass. Their their fears have come to pass. Mm -hmm. And so um, we knew this and it still happened. Uh, And we know it now. And there are people who are still pushing back, fighting back to say, um uh, they're trying to protect this space this turf as opposed to making the space and turf better they're trying to protect some old position that is not working and not representative uh and so that is 
anti-science. That's all the things that we say we don't like. We want people to let the best evidence dictate the positions. And um, as opposed to acting as if this, ev this position is you, it's not you. You are the scientist and you can move with the evidence. And so it's not a reflection on what kind of person you are. No. Uh, and so, but that's what, how it's playing out. Uh, people are, they're, they're pushing back. They're fighting back to keep that uh, sort of perspective. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, okay. Before we close, I want to talk about the end point of some of the drug use, right? Again, like I said, a lot of the work that I end up doing is with people who do struggle. Um, and, and then we do shift to a slightly different world. And again, it's not an yes or it's not a black or white, like gradation. You don't cross over some magic barrier and like all of a sudden you're addicted. It, there's a graduated level continuum notion to it, which is what it makes that, that makes it hard to talk about sometimes. But in the world that I live in, there's a part that mirrors what you're talking about. And it just dawned on me and I wanted to kind of bring it up. It's pretty well accepted in the field of addiction treatment for sure. That if somebody developed a drug addiction problem, the only solution for them is to quit. Now you talk a little bit about harm reduction and you suggest some new wording for it. And I think that's a very worthwhile, I'm very big on the use of language and the language matters. The moment you say, oh, we're doing a harm reduction techniques, like, oh, we're focusing on what's bad, right? Right off the bat. But let's, I mean, even if we put that aside for a second, the assumption is if you had a drug addiction problem, alcohol or any other drug, the only solution for you is to find a way to completely quit. It sounds nice. It makes people feel safe, but we are terrible at it. Terrible. The vast majority of people who use drugs at one point let alone those who develop problems with it, don't achieve lifelong forever abstinence at a different point. And that's looked at as a problem, primarily. I mean, I literally, I wrote a book called The Abstinence Myth, where I, I, the whole point I make is we are looking at the wrong end point. I want to make the jump from what you talked about in normal functioning society among people who just, and say that I personally don't even believe that it's that different when people develop a drug problem but that what happens instead is they fall perfectly into that trap that you mentioned which is if you've crossed over the barrier of having a problem with this stuff you are now conceived and perceived based on NIDA research and and everything we've done in the field as a different human like you you are now a different kind of person who needs to live by different rules than regular people um and yet nobody Nobody talks about the fact that, you know, the vast majority of people who develop a problem with drugs at one point end up living a very normal life later. Some of them abstinent, many of them not. Some of them bounce in and out of drug use throughout the rest of their lives. Um, I don't know how comfortable you are talking about this part because I know the book focuses on normal uh, range of drug use, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Um. Well, I think you are the expert in terms of this, but you you point out uh, uh, absolutely correctly that uh, that the dominant model in the U.S. is abstinence. Um, it's not the only model, of course, because we have uh, medication assistant treatments and that sort of thing. Um, and so, uh, when we look at uh, successful sort of treatment models. There are a number of people in the country around the world who are on methadone, but you don't know it. Uh, you don't know it because they don't tell you. I mean, I've learned this recently, uh, like all of these sort of big name people who are on methadone. I didn't know that. Uh, and then you go to a place like Switzerland and then you see that uh, they have taken it another step further. It's like, how about we give the people the drug that uh, their drug of choice, like heroin, as part of their treatment. Um, and we're okay with that. We think about it like uh, hypertension, treating hypertension or diabetes. People just take a medication for the rest of their life or as long as they, they feel that they need it. Uh, that's a perspective, uh, but that's a minority perspective. Um, and I just think that all of these things should be on the table 
um, when we think about um, uh, abstinence being the primary endpoint, the major problem with that is that uh, the focus is not on the, uh, on the relevant behavior. The relevant behavior is how well are your patients doing? Um, not what they're putting in their bodies, you know? So if you focus, if your focus is on the relevant behavior, then uh, you and the person, your, 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 your client patient will determine how you get there. Uh, yeah. But the focus should always be on the relevant behavior. One of the tricks that we've done in this country is always take the focus away from the relevant behavior when talking about drugs. Because if you take the focus away from the relevant behaviors, now you can be moralistic, judgmental, puritanical, all of those things mm. about some activity in which people are engaged. We always, we've done that with, for, exact, for example, sexuality, homosexuality. Take the focus away from the relevant behavior. The relevant behavior being, are they good people? Is this person a good person? Do they treat people well? That's the relevant behavior. But if you keep the focus away from that and on to who do they love? Now, now, now you can vilify them. Mm. Or if you keep the focus on what race are they uh, as opposed to what kind of people are they? Or you keep the focus on those are poor people. Let's just, you know, that's all we care about. But that's what we do with drugs. We take the focus away from the relevant behavior. And whenever you do that, you can bet that there are people who are getting ready to be abused. Oh, I have an example. And then I want to hear examples from you because I know you said you've had some interesting conversations since this book came out. I had a client just on a group literally four days ago or something. She came to us and on the group, she told us she used to drink about 60 glasses of wine a week. So that's about like 12 bottles, 11 to 12 bottles of wine a week. Um, slightly older woman in her early 60s, I think. And um, she just, and she goes, I realized that I was keeping track that uh, I'm down to about six bottles. I mean, six uh, glasses a week, mm -hmm. a 90% reduction in her drinking. She goes to her therapist and she talks about it. She says, hey, I, re I realized that I'm not drinking any more than 10 on any week, but my average is six and only on two different days. And his response is, just, I'm just really worried that you're still drinking. And I lost it on the group. I lost it. I was like, in what other field in the universe, when you want to change your behavior and you get 90% change in that behavior, in what field in the universe is that considered a failure? And in addiction, it is. If you're not perfect, you failed. And that's when moral judgment comes into the equation for me, because this might be a newsflash to anybody who doesn't agree with us, but actually they're probably not listening to the podcast. So um, <laughs> tell, tell your friends and send them this. None of us are perfect ever. You may have moments, you may have uh, you know, a three second just experience of reaching that nirvana perfection, but then it's fleeting and it goes away. And we're always living in this gray mud of, you know, floating around and we're all trying to be better people constantly. And for me, what is so upsetting, and I want to hear what, what's happened when, since you put out this book, what's so upsetting is I'm trying to help people live better lives. That's how I measure if they're doing better. Are you happier? Is your relationship better? Do you, are you having an easier time at work? You know, just, your emotional state, all that kind of stuff, right? And if that's moving in the right direction, you're a winner. The fact that you also wanted to drink less and you're drinking 90% less, that's beautiful because that's probably good for your liver long-term, right? Um, it is mind-numbingly painful for me that I can say this, and I probably won't get it from this podcast because the people who listen to this podcast like, like this point of view. But when I talk about this in bigger arenas, I inevitably get people that say your message is irresponsible and it's going to kill alcoholics or it's going to kill some addicts. And I always turn around and I say, no, 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 no. You got this wrong. Your message is going to kill some addicts and some alcoholics because you're setting up these 
impossible standard that they're supposed to measure themselves by. And when they fail, they go back on the only thing they know how to do, which you look down at, but it's a totally normal part of their lives. So you put out this book, you're a respected academic, a respected member of society, and you're coming out and saying, look, there are respected members of society using substances regularly. We have this wrong. Drugs are not the problem. I would love if you could share with us any anecdotes, any things that happened on the road, remotely, where people had a really hard time with this message. Obviously, you don't, you don't have to uh, use it. No, it's a, it's a really good question. Uh, like you, I get those people, I get emails, you know, because we're in COVID since the book has been released. I, I get emails. Um, there are people who say that uh, you're going to get people killed because they can't use drugs. You're telling people that they can use drugs. I get, I get, I get a few of those, but overwhelmingly, I get these emails from people who say, "Thank you, I'm not crazy. I have been, you know, I don't know. There was a brother combination. They are 50 now, and they've been using." Um, uh, opioids and drugs uh, and they own a business together and, and they can't tell their parents they get, can't tell anyone and they've been doing this for years and they are successful and they've been hiding this from their loved ones and there's so many stories that i get like that now uh, uh, about all of these people who feel uh, like their reality has finally been corroborated uh, mm. in this major public way uh, and so what you say to those folks uh, about their message killing people, um, that's a really important one because I get those messages from people who say that people have committed suicide or people have attempted to commit suicide. Uh, and so I really like what you're telling those, those folks. Um, uh, but our society has allowed people to say that to you, to say to you, our message of um, you don't have to be perfect. Uh, sometimes mm. people fail, but that's okay. Uh, and that's why we're not going to put that kind of expectation on you. We're going to work to allow you and us to come up with a more realistic one. That's a modest, moderate message. Not, it seems like everybody would agree until you add drugs to that message, uh, then they don't agree. Uh, and so we as a society have allowed people to come at you and say, you're killing people by having this reasonable, moderate message. That's what, that's what we have allowed people to, to say that. Yeah. And it's like, well, we have to look in the mirror and say, what kind of people are we when reason is seen as killing people. Mm. That's just, that's, that's nonsense. Yeah. And probably that point you just made probably has a lot to do with much of what's happening in the U S over the last, you know, decade or so. Um, Carl, I feel like I could keep you forever. Cause I, I love having these conversations. First of all, I'll just say, thank you for having the balls to write the book because I can imagine there were moments where you're sitting there going like, damn, I'm going to put this thing out and I'm just going to keep my fingers crossed. So I'm glad that it turned out the way that it did. It seems like it's having a really powerful impact. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, the moments of like uh, trepidation and writing the book. It, it, I really didn't have those kind of moments. Once I decided I was going to do it, uh, I was, uh, uh, I just thought naively, by the way, uh, that, oh, people will struggle with the arguments and then we'll make arguments better based on feedback and this conversation that we have. So that's my naive ass. I was thinking that I wasn't thinking that people would not like it. Uh, some people might not like it. And they didn't read the book to even listen to the arguments. Yeah. I wasn't thinking about that. But that's mm -hmm. my own naivety. And so um, that's been the most interesting thing. And at some level, um, I hope to be able to look at it and, and, and laugh at myself for, for not for, for being so naive about it. Mm, that's so interesting. Um, 
I don't usually do this on the Friday episode, but I'm going to ask our five questions of you because I really want to know the answer. So uh, this is our little hot seat questions. Uh, the first question is, what is the best advice you've ever received? Wow. Um, I, I, it was in high price, I think. Uh, I'm thinking about it came to my mind. First, I've received so much good advice. And so I apologize for people who I don't, don't, don't remember. But my dad, um, I was uh, in the Air Force and I was trying to uh, be stationed in Miami and not go to England. Um, so like my dad wanted me to go and get all of these different experiences. And then he, he knew why, why I was trying to stay in Miami because of girls. And he, and he, he basically was like, yo, pussy is everywhere. Get the fuck out of here. That's the best advice I got. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Thank you for that. That's amazing. Um, what is an experience that makes you incredibly proud? Maybe one of your proudest moments to date? Mm, has to be something my, that my kids have done. Like um, uh, my kids, uh, they both uh, graduated from uh, high school to sort of uh, really uh, uh, difficult high school for people who are not white and wealthy to graduate from and they managed to be intact decent good considerate people and so I'm, I'm most proud of mm. those guys for being uh, good decent people particularly after that experience wow that's amazing um, on the flip side of that what's been one of your, your most difficult experiences Ooh, um, it's ongoing. Uh, being a professor at Columbia, <laughs> it's just ongoing in part because trying to uh, be uh, a person who is connected with everyday people and trying to um, um, speak uh, on behalf or... Um, um, uh, to the best of my ability on behalf of the people who raised me. Uh, and so um, uh, it's hard. It's very hard going into meetings, being the only one. I mean, you know, like race is an easy thing to say, oh, you're the only one. But not only that, it's like the only one who is kind of like uh, feeling like uh, I have to remember all of those poor people who are getting their asses kicked, no matter who they are around the country. And and then um, being in spaces where um, uh, you feel alone um, in, in that respect. I mean, there are people at Columbia who also feel that way, but many of the meetings, uh, it's only one of you who are in those meetings. And so Got it. uh, it's, almost like be, it's almost like being, being trapped in the ivory tower in some weird way. Yeah, you know, it's like it's been beneficial, obviously because when I write stuff, uh, people pay attention because I'm in the ivory tower, right? Uh, I mean, if I was writing from, I don't know, uh, Threadgill County Community College, nobody would care. Uh, and so uh, on the one hand, it's the price that you pay, I pay, um, but it's still difficult, that's all. Sure, yeah, yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Um as it's difficult, I find that a lot of people we talk to have routines in place, things they do, self-care methods that they employ to thrive. Do you mind sharing some of the things you do to be the best version of yourself on a regular basis? At least eight hours of sleep. Um, I eat well. I mean, my smoothies, I do those every day, my sort of vegetable smoothies, um, then I exercise regularly. Um, this the release of this book has kind of disrupted that a little bit because I'm so busy. But exercise, eat well, sleep well. Uh, they are those are the most important things in my routine. And um, I try not to sweat the small stuff, but I don't always succeed at that. <laughs> I love it. Um... I call this podcast ignited. I call what we do ignited. And that's what we try to do for people. What gets you ignited? Uh, the thing that gets me excited, uh, uh, hearing from people uh, that what you are doing uh, is making a difference. Uh, 
in everyday people lives and um that really gets me excited and also uh knowing that i have a full supply of mdma gets me excited i love it i love it uh so do i by the way um but that's amazing man you know we've done some episodes we did an episode with um well we've done an episode with a handful of people but but some of the the powerful people who are doing this work, including Rick Doblin and, and some of those people. So um, I'm, I'm a full supporter of that movement. And maybe, maybe that's another tip of the arrow that we can use. So we're coming at them from m- multiple directions. Dr. Carl Hart, thank you so much for doing this. I love it. Again, thank you for writing the book. Thank you for sharing this time with us. Um, I can't wait for more and more people to come out of the closet as you suggested in the book and we get to rewrite these rules. Same here. I'm so glad we got a chance to do this. It's about four or five years uh, coming in the making. So I'm glad we could do this. Amen. Amen, brother. Thank you so much. Have a great, great rest of your week. For everybody listening right now, do me a favor. Carl is active on Ignited. So screenshot this. Um, just share. What was, a, what was a big aha moment for you And if you have people in your lives, maybe like those brothers that couldn't share this with their family, that you think need to hear exactly this conversation or read Carl's book, do it right now. Share it with them. We'd all love to hear it. Thank you. See you all next week. Thank you for tuning in to the Ignited Heroes Recovery Podcast. I really hope you found the information here useful and that we'll see you back here next week. And look, I want to make sure that this podcast is the most useful it can be for you. So please let me know by emailing info at ignited.com if there are any specific topics or questions you'd like to have addressed. As usual, if you like this episode, I would love for you to leave us a five-star review and rating. Thanks and see you next week.